Hey, what's going on guys? This is Matt. And today I want to talk about five things that I wish somebody told me when I started home brewing. If you're interested in content like this, make sure to like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel as there'll be more content like this coming out in the future. The first thing I want to talk about is to not sweat over your mash efficiencies and your brew house efficiencies. If you're not familiar with efficiencies, that just means uh, how well you're mashing and how many sugars you're converting during the mashing process and how much beer you're getting into the fermenter at the end of your brew day. If you look at home brewing forms especially, there's a lot of people that talk about how to maximize efficiencies and how to really stress over efficiencies. And I'm here to tell you that that really doesn't matter on a home brewing scale. As a professional, you have to make profit on your beer. So obviously every dollar you can squeeze out of your grains, you're going to at a, at a professional level, but at a home brewing level, it's just something you don't have to worry about. There's a lot of quick and easy ways to change your efficiencies and adjust your efficiencies at a home brew scale. For example, dry malt extract or DME, it's super cheap to have on hand. And I'd recommend to always have a few pounds of DME on hand, as if you are under your efficiency, you can always just put a little bit of DME, DME using a DME calculator to figure out how much you need to add to adjust to hit your target efficiency. But again, as a home brewing skill, it's something that you really don't have to stress out about. If you're a few points under or a few points over, it's not a huge deal. Also to talk about this, do not set unrealistic expectations with efficiencies. Always do a few test brews and see what your, what your system is capable of producing when it comes to efficiencies, and then set your expectation around those numbers. Don't go looking for a target number and trying to creep up to that. Just see what you can do naturally in your brewing process and try to hit those numbers regularly. Number two on this list is yeast health. Uh, and this is something that's really overlooked on a lot of home brewers, especially a lot of newer home brewers, because I know when I first started, I was doing a lot of research on uh, your hops and your malts and your water chemistry. And yeast health was kind of something that I kind of just didn't really think about all too much. I kind of just got a pack of yeast if it was dry or liquid, I would just sprinkle it on top and I would just let it rip. But yeast health is extremely important when it comes to home brewing. Yeast always has a preferred fermentation temperature. If you check on the yeast packs, it will always say what temperature you should be holding your fermentation temps at. And that's really important for yeast health. There could be a lot of off flavors that can be produced if it, the fermentation temp is too high, or you could stall your fermentation if your fermentation temperature is too low. What I would recommend doing is to try to monitor fermentation temperature. You do not need to spend a lot of money to do this. You can get a heat mat or a heat belt or heat wrap and then hook that to an Inkbird temperature controller, which is about $35. You can get, uh, you can actually tape the side of the probe from the Inkbird directly to the side of your fermenter. But even better, you can actually get a thermo well that you can attach to your bung and actually submerge the thermo well into your beer. And that will give you a much more accurate reading. You can set the desired fermentation temperature and hook the heat mat or the heat belt directly to your Inkbird and it will flick the heat mat on and off to regulate that temperature. It's a very cheap and easy way to regulate your fermentation temperature. And I'd recommend looking into that for overall yeast health and fermentation health. Another thing too, if you're just pitching one packet of yeast in your beers, a lot of times you're under pitching. There's a lot of pitching calculators online that I could recommend. One that I use all the time is from Beersmith 3. A lot of times, if you're over like the 1060, a lot of times you're gonna need two packs of yeast and that's something that's usually not talked about. And especially if you're coming from a home brewing kits, they always come with like one pack of yeast. Uh, so that's something that you're gonna have to get used to buying more yeast. Or another thing you can do to help promote yeast health is you can do a yeast starter. And there are plenty of yeast starter kits. The one that I use is from Northern Brewer. It comes in a flask, you get some DME with it. And then there's a little sponge on top and you can just make a yeast starter. There's tons of videos online how to do a yeast starter, but you'll make that around 24 to 48 hours before your brew day. Make a small yeast starter, pitch your yeast, and you're gonna propagate your yeast a day or two before your brew day. That way your yeast is gonna not only reproduce, you're gonna have more yeast, but you're also gonna have healthier yeast when you pitch your yeast for fermentation. The third thing I wanna talk about is getting into Brunebag as early as possible. 
If you're not familiar with what Bruna Bag is and you're typically an extract brewer, that's simply just instead of taking the liquid malt extract and adding it into hot water and mixing the liquid malt extract to have to get wort, is you're gonna be making the wort from scratch. And you might be asking, why would I do that when I have liquid malt extract? It sounds a lot cheaper and a lot easier. I can tell you it's easier, but you're, there's a lot of benefits to doing burn a bag over liquid malt extract. You're just gonna have a lot more creative control over your recipes. You can choose the individual malt that you can put into the beers. You can really fine tune your recipes. You can really grab certain flavors you're looking for. If you're looking for more biscuity flavors or chocolate flavors or coffee flavors or caramel flavors, there's a lot of different malts out there and a lot of different malters that are great to learn about and they all produce awesome flavors and malt, and malt flavors. So I would definitely recommend looking into Bruna Bag as well. The cost of entry for Bruna Bag is also very, very low. All you need is some sort of nylon bag that you can put in your kettle to put the grains in and that's about it. You don't need a ton of equipment to do a, to do Bruna bag. And there's also a, now a lot of electric options when it comes to Bruna bag. For example, behind me, I do Bruna bag and I've been brewing for around nine years. And I, so I can personally attest that a Bruna bag is a very, very good and easy way to get into all grain brewing. There's a lot of cheap systems that go as low as $200 and that are as high as $2,000 when it comes to electric burner bag options. I actually have a spreadsheet going over all the electric systems, so make sure to check that out in the description below. But it's never been easier to get into all grain brewing and specifically burn a bag for new or advanced home brewers. The fourth thing I wanna talk about and I wish I knew about when I first started home brewing is expensive equipment does not equal better beer. You'll see all the time if you're browsing the internet on YouTube, on home brewing forums, with these beautiful three vessel systems that cost $5,000. They're gonna have the shiny stainless steel fermenters. They're gonna have all the equipment in the world. And while those things can be very flashy and fun and look really cool, at the end of the day, you're still just making beer. Really what it comes down to guys, is your process and your experience and your knowledge about the ingredients you're using and the home brewing process in general. That's really what's important. Another thing with fancy and new equipment, a lot of times it adds complexity. It actually makes the process of brewing more complicated. Now you gotta clean more equipment and you gotta spend more time maintaining that equipment. Now I'm not to say that there aren't a few upgrades that I could personally recommend that aren't too expensive. All I'm here to say is don't think you need a $5,000 three vessel systems with $2,000 worth of shiny stainless steel fermenters to make good beer. There are plenty of brewers that I know that make excellent beer using plastic fermenters and that are doing Bruna bag with a nylon bag on a propane system. The fifth thing I wanna talk about is to meet other home brewers. Home brewing is a social hobby. It's a fun hobby to have a bunch of buddies, either family or friends, uh, to get into the hobby with you and to learn alongside you. For me, when I brew with friends or family, it definitely enhances it for me. It's fun to drink beers with your friends uh, while you're brewing beer. You can talk about what you're doing, show them what you're doing, show them how to make beer, show them what you've been brewing lately and show them how you made it. If you don't have a lot of friends that are interested in the hobby or any family that's interested in the hobby, there's always other alternatives. The first thing I could recommend is to join a home brewing club. Uh, I live in Michigan and I can personally say there's like 10 or 15 clubs in Michigan alone that I could join. So check your state, go to Facebook, go to Google, type in home brewing clubs and see what type of home brewing clubs are out there. Uh, as you can find like-minded people, people of all different experience ranges, people that are just starting out in the hobby and people that are want to maybe even take it to the next level in professional brewing. You can always learn something from everyone in this hobby. And most people that I talk to are more than willing to talk about their process and how they got to where they're at. If you're not really interested in the clubs thing, you can always join a YouTube community or find a online community that has a Discord. You can check the homebrewing forums and build relationships there. It's really fun to have some homebrewing friends online. I personally have a few people that I connect with 
only online that are homebrewing friends. You can even send people beer that you've made through the mail and you can sample it on Discord together. There's a lot of different ways to connect with people in this hobby. And I would definitely recommend trying to reach out and to find people online or in person because it definitely makes this hobby a lot more fun. Now I know I said I had five things, but I actually have a bonus uh, tip for you for something that I wish somebody told me when I first started homebrewing. And the bonus tip is to get into kegging and get out of bottling ASAP. The reason why I made this a bonus and not part of my core five is because it is expensive to get into it. It's not may not be accessible to everyone who wants to try this hobby out, but I do wanna talk about it because for me, I know getting out of bottling was one of the best decisions I ever made. When you're first starting out, I would still recommend bottling it before taking the plunge into kegging because it can be a little expensive. So what are the benefits of kegging? I would say the main few things that you can benefit the most from for kegging is number one, it shortens the amount of time that you, from brew day to beer in your glass, you do not need that extra time to put your, your sugar, your priming sugar in your bottles and let them carbonate. When you're using kegs, you can take, it really only takes up to 24 hours to carbonate your beers. You can get your carbonated beer much faster. Also bottles are just kind of a pain in the butt to have. It's a pain to clean them. And it's also a pain to have enough inventory so you have enough bottles for the next brew day. Also with kegging, if you only want a half glass or you want to fill up a growler or something, you always have that option with kegging. And also you always have control over your carbonation level. When you're using priming sugar in your bottles, it's pretty much whatever you add for your priming sugars you're kind of stuck with with bottles. With kegging, if you overcarb, you can always reduce the carbonation in the kegging system. Or if it's undercarb, you can always increase the pressure in your, in your kegging system. So you have a lot more control over your finished product as well. And you still have the option of bottling directly from your kegs as well. I also have a video talking about a product that I bought to bottle right from my keg. So check out the description below to check out the Blickman Beer Guide. Now to talk about cost real quick, as I did include it in the last because it may not be accessible to everyone, you can expect it to cost somewhere between $300 to $600 depending on your setup. But there are ways to save money when it comes to kegging, for example, buying used kegs or making your kegerator by converting a freezer, a chest freezer or a fridge into a kegerator. I also have a video going over how to build a DIY kegerator, freezer combo, a keyser. Uh, so check out the description below where I go over how to build that as well to save money. But anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. There'll be more content like this coming out in the future. I also do grain to glass videos if you guys are interested in those. Check out my channel for more videos. Anyway guys, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.